So no longer live. What does it mean? Live now. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all the participants. Mesia. Um, good morning. Early morning uh, to you, Sam. And uh, uh, I don't. Uh, Anton is well. good morning, right? So it's a pleasure to have uh, all of you here. We are just missing a few other people. Probably they'll join in. Um, so my name is Girish Ramchandran. I I chair this particular session. I'm the uh, president of uh, Asia, uh, Asia Pacific for Tata Consultancy Services. So I've got a very exciting panel here with me. Um, I've got uh, Swanith as well who just joined in. Swanith, good afternoon. So um, <clears throat> we have got a. We're going to spend the next one hour discussing about cyber and cyber transformation. Okay. So, before I introduce my uh, fellow panelists, I, um, if you look at what uh, COVID has done, COVID has essentially accelerated the pace of changes that you've seen in in uh, what we call the Industry 4.0. Okay. And the pandemic is just an inflection point for digitization and transformation of many industries and sectors. Okay. And uh, Digital technologies like blockchain, AI, data analytics, and cloud are crucial to build as well as reimagining the future. Especially blockchain has uh, received significant attention over the last few days, few years, but uh, driven by uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, especially on regulatory crackdowns recently by India uh, just two days before. Okay. And uh, money laundering as well as financial crimes environmental concerns as well as heightened tax security. So as regulators catch up on blockchain, uh, governments can and should do more to support blockchain innovation as well as adoption by creating a flexible adoption, uh, adoption of technologies. So I've got a very interesting panel with me. So I'm going to start off uh, with um, uh, with Anton, you okay first. Um, Anton, um, you are an uh, you are an expert in ETFs, okay? And uh, the first uh, U.S. Bitcoin futures actually traded uh, fund launch, launched last month, um, allowing investors to buy as well as sell assets outside of cryptocurrency exchanges. Okay? What does this mean for the cryptocurrency industry as well as for investors? You can also give a little bit about uh, your own company as well as then uh, throw light on this topic as well. Thank you, Anton. Pleasure. Yes. So. Thanks for having me here, and it's a pleasure to be here with the distinguished panel and kind of to dive straight into the discussion. Just first to briefly say what uh, Floftech, uh, my company, does. So just very simple. We're a market maker for digital assets, uh, for coins, tokens, and cryptocurrencies connected to more than 100 exchanges worldwide uh, where we provide liquidity on a daily basis for what you would call highly liquid coins and tokens. This is your Bitcoin and Ether. But likewise, we provide liquidity and market make for highly illiquid tokens. And additionally, we run a market make making fund where professional institutional investors can get exposure to our market making. So this is in a nutshell what Floftech does. Now, with regards to the ETF, uh, first, let's explain maybe the context uh, of this question, if I can say it like that, is that for many years, professional investors, institutional investors are looking for ways how to allocate capital in this new, exciting, emerging asset class of uh, cryptocurrencies, digital assets, and so on. And that was not accessible or possible in a very straightforward way, in a sense of buying a product that's listed on global exchanges and get exposure through that way. And while other countries and jurisdictions around the globe have launched and enabled creation and listing of such products, for instance, in Switzerland, we have an exchange traded product that gives you access to Bitcoin for many, many years now. In US, that was not the case. And if I can you, can, you can wonder, well, why wasn't the crypto community or the digital asset community able to uh, launch such a product, which means an ETF that will give you exposure to Bitcoin? It was due to regulatory concerns around market integrity, uh, transparency, and uh, how to deal with uh, market manipulation. And the reason for that is because digital assets, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are traded around the globe on unregulated trading venues. So the biggest exchanges around the globe, they actually don't have a license in a, the traditional uh, sense. So that was one of the biggest concerns uh, for the U.S. regulator, U.S. regulators, because U.S. Mm -hmm. has many regulators, not just one. And we have, I can say that we as a community have made that first step to enable that in a sense that uh, CME, uh, Chicago Merchandise Exchange, has launched Bitcoin Futures many years ago. And uh, um, 
the crypto community has uh, been successful in launching an exchange traded fund uh, that tracks actually the um, price of Bitcoin futures. So it's not the case that actually in the back, uh, once people, when uh, professional institutional investors, but now retail as well, in some cases, purchases such ETF that they get exposure to Bitcoin uh, uh, per se, but they actually get exposure to Bitcoin uh, futures, which is maybe the second best thing. So this is a little bit of the context and the background. And maybe also uh, a, a question for all of us here is how to address the regulatory concerns, meaning market integrity and what the participants, the exchanges, the market makers, the traders, the investors have to do to enable grow, to grow this even further because the asset class is huge now. And it's, I mean, the market cap of cryptos are now over two trillion and only way is up going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Um, Ted, I want to come to you, Ted. I, I come, I, I'll take your policy question a little bit later, Anton. Um, uh, Ted, I'll come to you. Um, um, after giving us introduction about your company, um, it will be interesting to hear from you about the Rooms platform. I believe that has been a huge success um, across. What has been the learnings from that? Uh, yeah, so um, Kenja uh, is a company I founded 10 years ago, actually, in Japan. Um, and we service uh, uh, enterprise customers. 95% of our uh, revenue comes from the large comp uh, companies like that. And basically... Uh, what a large enterprise is about is they, they are about, um, they need a high level of security. Mm. Um, obviously they, they, they have that and, and uh, we're lucky enough to, to count, uh, you know, the, one of the global top three investment banks as our client. Um, but they need security. Um, they also need um, some bit of uh, visualization because they have a lot of, uh, a lot of information that's going all, you know, all, all over the place. But, um, Blockchain is a is a great technology, um, but uh, the problem is not very visual on the on the surface. It's a sixty it's a sixty four bit hash, and um, and and the consumer will wonder what it's about, and even your your corporate clients will wonder what it's about. Uh, what we've um, done is we've attached a visual layer on top of uh, on top of a blockchain. So imagine that if you have a QR code, you you see not a sixty four bit hash, but you'll see a website. With a bunch of files and provenance of who did what when against those files, um, it's kind of like we we supercharge a content management system and you uh, know basic workflow, and we we put a blockchain on it, and um, and basically that that's that's the provenance. Now people will say, well, wait a second, your your content that's that's cloud based. It's true, it is, but um, the, the interesting thing is the hash, the the thing where you actually need blockchain is. When rubber meets the road, I've got a set of information, um, and I want to make it visual, mm -hmm. and I want to show the provenance at that moment in time. I put a hash against it right then, a blockchain, and that's what we we do. And it's it's very visual, and and because of that, um, yeah, we've got a lot of traction, 10x growth last last year, um, and um, uh, in things like uh, halal food. Uh, I was just speaking um, to Sam about. Uh, the fact that we're in Indonesia, uh, working with largest um, uh, largest certification agencies to do that, and um, or Seven and I, um, you know, the parent company of Seven Eleven, to do uh, factory level certification, and um, a few learnings that we have that's a little bit different um, is that I think uh, blockchain is very revolutionary, but if you think about it, enterprise customers are very evolutionary, right. um, and so you have to bridge the gap between the two. And one of the things, for example, is that um, a lot of blockchain is about disintermediation of, of everything. But if you're going to a, um, like the certification bodies of Indonesia, you, you don't want to disintermediate them, right? Because mm -hmm. they're, they've got their own business. So we work with them as partners, right? And so, um, and this is a very big difference is that we're not trying to set up a separate certification uh, aside from that. We're trying to work with them. Um, to, to do blockchain for that. And in a way, um, you know, I had a question actually, Sam, from a venture capitalist. They said, well, you're not traditional, you're, you're central point then. You're not, a, you're not a traditional blockchain. And I said, no. But I said, do you want to be legal in Indonesia? Because if you want to be legal, you have to work with the, the, um, the, the government appointed um, institutions. So I think that's one, one point of learning for us is that um, it's not necessarily revolutionary. Um, we want to work with the companies to be evolutionary. Um, that's one thing. Um, 
I think the second thing for us is that, uh, again, we, I was talking about it a little bit, but people are finding it hard to figure out use cases for blockchain, right? You talk to CIOs and they're saying, well, I'm not so sure how I really want to uh, bring this into my, my operations, right? They had maybe uh, some initials, initial early projects where it was very expensive and ROI was very hard. And so uh, for that, we say, you know, here's a $10,000. We can start you off on a, on a thing where um, for that amount of money, we can give you something that works out of the box and we can customize from there. Um, so it, it's a different model. Um, one that's, again, more evolutionary and more visual because I was talking about that. Um, people don't understand the use case unless they see it. Like they say, oh, okay, halal food chain. I see, okay, and now I can see a picture of the certificate. I can right. see the PDF. I can see, you know, the, the pictures of the factory. It makes people feel more more um, safe about what they're they're eating, not just a not just a sixty four bit hash. And so that's um, that's what our learning was. Oh, great. Uh, I will come to the disintermediation question to all of you. It's, it's an interesting one because as it goes up to scale, I mean, um, we'll have to see how enterprises adopt to it. Um, Swani, I'm, I'm going to come to you. Um, you have built a very interesting uh, blockchain entertainment platform. And what I found interesting is that you have a lot of partners today in the platform. Okay. So how did you build that ecosystem and, and what has been the learnings from that particular uh, building that ecosystem? Please? Yeah, sure. So I, look, I come from, a, uh, as, as we like to say, blockchain, a, a trad fi background, traditional finance background. Um, so my background is, you know, institutional finance. Uh, I was at Goldman Sachs for about uh, eight years. Um, and so, you know, I think moving, uh, you know, doing something within the TMT sector was always a natural fit. Um, fast forward to around 2016, 2017, 2018, I was observing this big trend um, of uh, effectively uh, developers, uh, tech-related entrepreneurs um, doing these, you know, um, blockchain-based offerings. Uh, and since I come from, you know, a traditional finance background, I, I just found it um, in my blood to sort of investigate or look into it or, you know, learn more about it. So I started attending conferences around that time. And I found that, you know, blockchain as a technology is actually not that revolutionary. You know, if you break it down into, into, into little bits, it's effectively, um, you know, we all learn something called double entry accounting or a lot of us learn double entry accounting in school. Right. It's almost like triple entry accounting, right? With a third layer of verification. Obviously, I'm simplifying it significantly, uh, but, but that's effectively what it is. And I saw that, look, I, I made up my mind in around 2017, 2016, that blockchain as a technology is definitely here to stay. Uh, you know, variety of applications across industries um, that are pertinent to blockchain as a technology. And, and then, you know, you move on to the, the, the ecosystem of crypto, uh, which utilizes blockchain as a technology. And I think my learnings were, hey, how can we take blockchain as a technology and bring it into the media and entertainment sector? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we set out to do uh, as, as one use case. And today we are building a decentralized media entertainment ecosystem. Um, you know, based on the Algorand blockchain, which, well, you know, we found, you know, there's several main chains across the world. Uh, we found Algorand for our use case as being quite scalable for us, um, for, for our particular use case. And the idea was, how do we incentivize users, particularly in, um, you know, lower income diaspora markets like India, Indonesia, Africa, Latin America, Malaysia, etc. How do we bring them into the ecosystem and actually, uh, you know, incentivize them to consume uh, or, or engage with content? And I do believe that, you know, we're entering a phase of, you know, we're going from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0, and that's going to be extremely relevant. Uh, and I think, you know, almost everyone on this call may have a light bulb moment when they realize, uh, you know, everyone here has probably already had that light bulb moment that, you know, all blockchain is pretty much uh, going to be applicable to almost every single industry 
uh, in the world today, as Anton said, you know, I think it's a point of no return uh, at this moment. I think that governments uh, are looking to embrace blockchain as a technology and looking to regulate uh, crypto as an industry. And some of the challenges I faced when we were building this platform was, number one, talent. You know, blockchain is, uh, is a very nascent industry. So if you look at it, uh, you know, look, uh, 2008, right, uh, was was pretty much when it was created. And so, um, you know, finding, you know, good talent uh, is definitely a difficult thing to do. Um, but, you know, people are very interested in blockchain and we have some very, very talented developers uh, in India, outside of India that actually uh, work with us. And, and, and I really uh, admire the type of... Um, type of caliber of, of people coming into blockchain today as, as an industry. And, you know, within the last three years, you've seen a significant transition of more legitimate players uh, from institutional backgrounds coming into the industry, shaping the industry, helping the industry transform, bring real use cases to blockchain. Uh, and I think that that is something that will continue to grow. Uh, the, other, the other challenge is obviously from a regulatory perspective, right? When you launch your own network on a public, uh, you know, uh, publicly, you know, how uh, right now everything is sort of dependent on self-regulation. And that's okay when you come from an institutional background. But like in every industry, there are bad players. So how can we combat that, right? Um, and I think that is one of the challenges why people and mass adoption is not there yet is because people can't fully trust it, right, at the moment. And I think that'll improve over time. It's not an overnight thing. Um, but, you know, I hope that sort of answers my question or your question. Um, would love to hear everybody else's thoughts on it. And thank you. Thank you, Sunit. I, I'll, I'll come to your this thing about trust. Um, I'll, I'll come now to Sam. Okay. Sam, very early morning for you. Um, thank you for being awake. Uh, first of all, uh, I know that uh, you are an angel investor. So what exactly do you look for when you decide to invest in these technologies? As Swanit says, this is new emerging technologies. Do you see a lot of use cases when you invest? What do you see when you go and invest in, into these technologies? Yeah, a quick, quick point of clarification. Um, I'm not j here as uh, just a, an angel investor of my own, right. but I also run a fund. Uh, block accelerate VC, and similarly, we do invest in early stage opportunities, primarily in seed and in A. So, um, maybe a brief background. Uh, we are generally Seattle-based um, seed and A investors. The fund would write uh, early inv investment tickets, um, depending on the si size of the investment, up to half a million. We have a co-investment vehicle that would come into. Uh, quadruple the up to 4x the investment amount um, and generally we do invest with the thesis of bringing blockchain in the enterprise workflows whether those workflows remain in the enterprises that are looking to be evolutionary or we are proposing alternatives for moving those workflows outside of a given enterprise but whatever would have been the workflow inside a government uh, inside an NGO, inside an enterprise, inside a foundation, if they can be brought on chain and governed by smart contracts, whether in the realm of uh, tokens uh, or managing other data, um, we are interested in investing in that. So uh, with that context, um, you are asking what we're looking for? Yeah. Um, I would say, in general, we're, like most investors, uh, prior prioritizing um, maybe three things. Uh, we have a whole list of points we check for in our comprehensive due diligence. Um, but uh, if I were to sort of summarize, we look at uh, the team, the product market fit, and um, the growth potential. So in the context of the team, what matters most is, is to say missionary team, um, that's interested in growing this up because they care about the, the problem. Um, are they competent? 
are they experienced to know what it is that they are trying to solve? Uh, and are they people that can establish themselves as thought leaders in the space? Um, in terms of the novelty of an approach and why that's actually the better way to go about doing things. In terms of the product market fit, which is the second point, um, I guess I would break that down to, um, is the product really catering to an emerging need? Before maybe it's seen obvious to the eventual users, do we see that there's going to be an emerging need for the product they're offering? Uh, is it really offering an element of novelty? Is it a new way to put a new asset type on chain? Is it a new way to govern a corporate or enterprise workflow? Is it a new way to track assets uh, and make data available? And then if they keep operations in that way, is it scalable? All that, um, I would say, factors into the product market fit. And then third is the growth potential. Obviously, we're in the game of investing for for gains and category-defining companies. Um, and the growth potential is a combination of this thermodynamic equilibrium, eventual market size, where things can be, but also it's a matter of uh, how, how fast they can get there. And that rate highly depends on how they're structured. Um, unfortunately uh, for companies, uh, unfortunately for dApps, um, we have a different scale of an upside, different rate of iterations uh, that we can see in how those entities are set up. So if a company is in effectively tens of people catering to tens of companies or tens of people, then you can only create so many transactions, even if they're really high value, you have a sort of carrying capacity of how much value a company could deliver on. Whereas a decentralized application in the context of a, you know, thousands of nodes or thousands of service providers, catering to thousands of individuals or thousands of companies, um, you have the greater upside of creating more value. Um, of course, this has to be paired with the third element of this sort of growth potential, which is survivability. Unfortunately, companies have higher sur survivability than that. So if I were to take, you know, 100 companies, a batch of fresh 100 companies and a batch of, you know, fresh 100 DAOs, um, six months or a year from now, more of the DAOs will sort of do their iterations and see they haven't been able to establish a sustainable place, whereas a company takes longer to actually conclude that experiment. So those are the three things we look at. just wanted to break it down um, in each, but fundamentally it's team, product, market fit, and growth potential. Thank you. Thank you. That gives a lot of clarity. I want to now get back into uh, into policy because that we, we spoke a little bit about policies. Okay? Um, since all of you come from... Um, different countries and backgrounds that there is a lot of policy changes which are affecting what is happening around. Okay. Uh, what, is, what, what is your view on the existing policy, fr policy framework um, in, in, in your respective countries or regions? Sorry, I'll start with you because there is a lot of buzz about what happened in India two days back. Okay. I'll start yeah. with you. And then, yeah. Yeah, look, uh, I, I'm I'm extreme. I mean, we we as a company are extremely supportive of positive, uh, positive uh, crypto digital asset regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you can call it. Uh, it there's many different words people use for uh, for a variety of things, but we're, we're I think we're generally positive on regulation on the industry. Um, and we think it's a very important thing, especially uh, in a country like India, where there are, um, you know, capital controls um, and, and, you know, effectively, um, uh, uh, you know, currency that can't be brought outside of the, of the country, uh, you know, um, in specific. And so, you know, when you look at the framework, I think it's, uh, it's very important for uh, the citizens of the country, number one, to be... Uh, you know, especially for retail uh, investors within the country to be protected. I think, you know, I think that uh, overall the government is aligned on that. And I think there is some sensationalism uh, uh, to news um, that, that, does, that does occur. It's happened before. Uh, I think that uh, we, you know, sit on uh, Internet Mobile Association of India, uh, part of the Blockchain Assets and Crypto Committee. Uh, and so, you know, when we're uh, speaking with 
you know, um, different governments were highly supportive of, you know, the way they're thinking through some of the regulations, you know, and, and it, by the way, it's an educational process, right? Because, you know, uh, they have to learn a, a, a new industry from scratch and make sure that their regulations, so I, I do, I do sympathize with all the work that governments do to get to a stage to, you know, uh, put out some concrete resolution, uh, re you know, uh, laws and, and regulations. And I think that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I think the government is thinking through that. So I want to reserve any uh, sort of comments until they finally come out with something. Uh, but I do think that, you know, the framework that Singapore has designed around digital assets is extremely, extremely helpful uh, for the blockchain industry. Um, you know, UAE is thinking about very, uh, you know, interesting regulations from that perspective. And so, you know, as more and more governments tend to adopt, um, you know, blockchain and crypto and digital assets uh, as an industry, I think they, you know, for, firstly, I think that uh, it's so decentralized at this stage that it's very difficult to ban it in its entirety. But then if you're able to basically uh, control the way that people, uh, you know, move those assets in and out of the country uh, or pay taxes, uh, you know, that's all very positive regulations for the industry. The whole industry supports that. Uh, I think everybody on the call would support that. And, and I would really want to uh, ask any, everybody here, you know, Sam, Anton, um, you know, what, what your thoughts are. And Ted, uh, you've been in this for a long time as Ted, let's come to you, Ted. A uh, lot of action in Asia, China, yeah. Japan. What What is your view? Yeah, so um, I think there's, um, you know, the larger uh, countries, uh, Japan, um, I'm part of an organization called the GBBC, the Global Business Blockchain Council. And um, and part of it is working with governments and working mm -hmm. with government organizations to, to see things. But, um, you know, in Japan, uh, I think change happens, um, I don't want to say quite glacially, but it is pretty slow. Um, and uh, they want to see what other countries are doing before they introduce something in Japan too. So um, I was I was actually uh, uh, talking to the head of the patent office um, and um, and talking to him about blockchain. But the questions were uh, mostly around okay, well, how's it working in other countries? And again, uh, kind of cautious. Let's see how it goes on other uh, other areas first. There's also um, harmonization between international standards. So. Um, in a lot of cases, it's not so simple as a unilateral move from a country. Uh, they have to harmonize with everyone else. So um, one small example in Japan would be the J-Credits. Um, it's a carbon credit for Japan. They just announced, announced it this year, but um, they don't really even have their, uh, their ETS up. Um, and so uh, they're, they're, uh, they're taking kind of baby steps on, on things. So the other um, area that we're working with is um, actually... Uh, the, quite the opposite is uh, if you think about the um, the people who can move the fastest, it's the smallest ones, smallest countries, island countries, literally island countries, L literally a blue ocean strategy. Uh, how, how about that, right? Literally blue ocean. So um, what we found in there is that um, in uh, in smaller countries, they're too too small for a big big company. Um, I, I can assure you, uh, right, that, uh, that Goresh, that you're not interested in, in seeing a country with a million people, right? Um, <laughs> right? Because it, it, like when I was at Vodafone, we, our size is too big. We, right. we figured out all oh, our compliance officers, everything, cost of doing business would be too ex prohibitively expensive to enter in, but they're too big for a small company, mm. right? So there's, think, a, there's an interesting size where um, I think that uh, we're finding uh, – you know, platform a general platform like ours, we're finding uh, kind of a nice use cases, and we can work actually with the government. Um, yes. You know, meeting with ministers, and um, you know, it's not hard because the minister is kind of like going down to your, you know, the local city hall or something, right? Tokyo itself is forty-two million people, so yeah. <laughs> um, right, yeah, it's that that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, Anit, you are saying something. I was actually saying, I think Tata probably has more, employs more people than that uh, population. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the company that I have is around 520,000, so slightly, 
slightly bigger. Slightly under a country. Slightly. Slightly, yes. Yeah. Every, every time I see a Range Rover on the street, I always say nice Tata. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Sam, I'll come to this because um, Americas is uh, very interesting. Uh, if I look at the whole Americas as a whole. And yeah. um, Salvador was in the news recently about <laughs> about Bitcoin. So what is your view on policy across, across Americas? Okay, I think there's some learning from Europe. And Singapore, but um, so generally speaking, there is this alphabet soup of regulators, right? Where we have um, uh, SEC, CFTC, um, FTC, and um, FinCEN, and um, all of these regulators are in a way having their fights in a way for the ter appropriate turf to regulate and what part of the the pie that um, should be their dom domain um, because blockchain ultimately ties into so many different facets and ultimately the tokens could be seen as the uh, investment instrument but if it's a utility token then there's consumer protections that factor in there is a uh, money transmission involved um, then uh, it brings in you know, FinCEN. So um, there's an emerging uh, clarity even on the part of regulators who should be handling which part of the pie. Um, and I'm seeing particularly SEC being a bit of a dampener of growth where this um, merit regulator role they're taking up instead of a disclosure regulator in the language of um, as to Pierce, uh, is in a way limiting uh, U.S. being the jurisdiction that most token projects may want to locate out of. And so if I'm simply interested in uh, building an integration to a messaging app to also accommodate cryptocurrency payments, now do I have to register for a money services business, acquire money transmitters license? Uh, if I'm a DEX, what am I supposed to do? Um, and so it creates a, a very obfuscated framework of not knowing exactly how you would how you'd comply. Um, whereas in Europe, we're seeing yes, the EU uh, offerings on say um, pilot programs are being adopted across different jurisdictions. I'm seeing uh, Switzerland is an innovator actually. Um, they endorse this fintech license in 2019. Um, FINMA, which is their financial markets uh, supervisory authority, is looking to remove these obstacles um, to allow for more fintech companies and blockchain companies to um, innovate more easily and bring new products to market. Similarly, there is a, a series of uh, L countries. Yeah. Um, Lithuania, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, I think, are very interesting. Uh, Lithuania's exchange license and um, what was it, uh, crypto wallet and custodian li services license, I think. Um, and Liechtenstein's financial market authority is sort of endorsing uh, the value that blockchain can provide. They have a blockchain act. Um, Luxembourg is looking to be a pioneer in the blockchain world with fintech platforms. Um, so in a way, I see the equivalent of uh, EU offering sort of not the ceiling of what could be allowed or what should be allowed, but baseline frameworks of these different uh, states to comply with and then erect their own principles, their own bylaws and policies on top of that. I, in a way... U.S. could adopt that, where if the SEC and the federal regulators uh, turned into not merit regulators, but disclosure regulators that could form the baseline for then the states to compete with each other to find most favorable regulations to allow for blockchain companies and innovators to experiment. Hey, am I going to look to incorporate in this state or the other? And that kind of uh, experimentation and free market could uh, help us find the better regulatory framework. So I would say in general, uh, there's innovators in the European landscape and those could be 
uh, inspiration points for states and maybe EU uh, more setting the baseline regulator, disclosure regulator might be the inspiration for the federal level regulators in the US. So Anton, before I come to you, I think, you know, what we are probably hearing is that um, all the smaller countries are probably are much more risk takers right now and they can afford to do that. Whereas the larger countries are waiting and, and seeing how this plays out and uh, and and then bringing in the regulations. Is that, is that correct, uh, um, um, Anton? And what do you see in um, in Switzerland as well as from vantage point here? Thank you. Yeah. So I will with great honor take that Switzerland is a small risk taking country because if you ever went to Switzerland, <laughs> no. it's not very it's not very risk taking at all. But uh, thank you for uh, giving us that honor. So maybe just I'll give an analogy uh, to how I see regulations. So uh, I'm currently in Dubai. So when you uh, leave Dubai and come yeah. one month later, you will come and see what say what are these new buildings? I have never seen this, and it's all done right. within a month. And the right. stuff that I have seen before is gone, you know, and yeah. then you wonder, wow, this is an amazing country, you know, and then you go back yeah. to Switzerland. And if you haven't been there for 10 years <laughs> and you come back and you will say this place has not changed. What is going on here? So right. this I, let me now give an analogy to those two approaches. So what Switzerland does, but Europe in general, they take existing uh, legislation and regulation and say how we can take this new innovative technology and put it in within the existing framework because and then actually the approvals are very fast because you say we know how we want to see things if you fit to a certain extent with that framework we are fine and happy to give out licenses you know but what switzerland does and you're very cleverly is they maintain technology neutrality so if you sign your contract with a pen i don't know whoever does that but if you sign it with a pen and send it by mail or if you do it through a smart contract digitally Switzerland doesn't care about that. That's technology aspect of it. Yeah. So this is how Switzerland does it. Now, maybe how uh, UAE does it or Dubai, they come in, they said, well, let's write out completely full blown new laws and the old ones, we just tear them apart and we forget about them. So these are the two different approaches, how to do things or how I have seen them happening. You know, And one maybe additional thing that I would like to point out that uh, maybe I don't know if a lot of people are aware of it, uh, but I, in Switzerland, we have two native crypto banks meaning that the yeah. core banking infrastructure is adapted for cryptocurrencies, coins, and digital assets. So it's highly unique and innovative. But when you go and talk to those poor people in those regulated entities, they will tell you one thing. We're not allowed to do anything. And this is a very, very interesting to hear because we are an innovative, amazing industry where, you know, one month is one decade, you know. But on the other side, you talk to regulated entity and then you realize, okay, they're not allowed to do anything. It's a very slow approval process when they speak with the regulator. And I think now the sweet spot, this is I think what everybody said here, is in the middle. How can you launch a DAO and hopefully explain to the regulator what the heck that is, but at the same time, you know, uh, in, in, in likewise have the stakeholders on board that you can actually uh, uh, be operational with that DAO, but the other side leverage all the innovation that the DAO brings you. And that's an art. And I think maybe Sam as an investor sees that the most. How do you actually uh, become an artist that leverages as the both? So this is a little bit, you know, how I see it and how I have seen it in Europe and Switzerland. But I think also the alphabet soup of regulators that was giving Sam a headache when he was saying it doesn't help in general. So maybe centralization sometimes is not so bad. So let's think about that. Thank you. Yes, I do. I do uh, that, by the way, very astute observations from everybody. Uh, I do want to say that, look, there are also countries that do come in first uh, with some very positive regulations, right? Uh, and I'll give you an example of one country, Malta, right? It was probably one of the first countries that came in with very positive forward-looking digital asset laws, digital asset framework. But three years later, like you don't see many blockchain companies being domiciled there anymore. And, and, and it's just, even when you have those laws, there's also, you know, an aspect of execution and how you can execute those laws uh, or framework or guidelines um, in, in, in a manner that attracts a lot of companies to come and, you know, uh, you know uh, build up uh, th their companies uh, in your jurisdiction. So I just wanted to point Thank you, Swanit. I'll leave the 
the policy framework we spent sufficient time on this policy framework let's get into some implementation issues okay i want to get into ted okay ted we talked about disintermediation it's an interesting one okay because uh, uh, it can lead to dis- disintermediation across multiple industries okay and especially uh, if you look at uh, decentralized finance for institutional investors okay um, so there would be there would be issues in in uh, in uh, disintermediation okay do you think the industry is ready for disintermediation they're never ready are they <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they yeah. got disintermediated. Inter- um, yeah. uh, no, I, I think um, disintermediation will will occur at different paces in different industries, of course, right? Um, yeah. And um, and the use cases, I think. Um, I think the other thing we have to all realize is that blockchain is use case driven, right? Yeah. So um, so we have to think about the use case, and uh, you know we're doing uh, because we have a general platform that can. apply blockchain to you know content and and a set of um a provenance so we um we have uh um different speeds like disintermediation uh with an investment bank it's a it's actually a they they have a big portfolio of real estate um uh for them it's much more about um uh they want to add payments on a um a blockchain certification that goes along with their payment system um and so that would help speed their their in, internal transactions so um i think it 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 uh it just depends on the industry and it's kind of hard to generalize because there's so many different things but but if you were to try to say um one thing is that no they're not ready and um i think that uh the better way is to partner um and that's what i'm saying is that instead of getting completely disintermediated um before you that happens um uh, come to a company that actually would be your partner versus the guy who's going to be the revolutionary so um yeah that's my take on it thank you swanid so, you've got uh, you got a lot of partners in the in the program um how has uh, how have they taken into um the whole concept of disintermediation look i think um i think the media and entertainment uh sector is in embracing blockchain pretty pretty well um you know look i think one of the the most arguably probably the easiest use case of blockchain in um at least the digital media sector is ip rights management right. and i think that um uh, you know i, I hope uh girish you haven't been a uh, victim to this but <clears throat> you've seen what happens in india sometimes and i'm sure you've heard stories where somebody takes a house and they sell it on three times yeah and so th- and this happens in india you know yeah. reasonable amount right and so you know the the buyers of that house are left fighting with each other for the next 10 years right uh, the the seller has got three times the money right and it's the same same issue uh in in digital media rights right if i have if i own uh, a right uh, of of a of a you know piece of content um I'm able to monetize it. Uh what if I sell it on to Anton, uh you know, Sam and Ted at the same time. They don't know each other and they're left fighting for the rights and you know, it just becomes a legal debacle and I think that's arguably one of the easiest use cases IP rights management on blockchain. From a partner perspective, you know, a lot of our partners understand and I I think we're fortunate enough today that all eyes are on, you know, web 3.0 metaverse uh blockchain uh and so people realize the importance of really embracing that technologies and companies are uh at least in India I would say are very forward thinking in that regard even outside of India uh a lot of our partners are extremely forward thinking and they do want to embrace um you know blockchain as a technology to either engage uh more customers um to bring more people onto their platforms uh i think it's a great engagement tool that people uh, do believe um you know there is and, and i think that a lot of media companies understand the importance of this intermediation uh, at the moment decentralization uh democratization i mean these are all terms that are very uh, regularly thrown around in rooms uh these days thank you we are uh, we are out of time but i want to um, uh, end with one question to all of you 
we have seen uh, policies are maturing uh, we are seeing problems in um, in the whole chain in terms of disintermediation okay and it's it's an it's an it's a new it's a new technology which is coming up okay um what do you think will it this be a behind the scenes invisible technology that will change the world or uh, do you see that uh, this will become mainstream in the next couple of years sam i'll start with you uh it will be behind the scenes in most applications but i envision uh it will also be very forefront in some aspects we will probably be carrying a wearable wallet or a means to have a bio integrated private um way to sign for transactions maybe a integrated chip that checks for we are not under duress we are still alive and we are still ourselves um you know it, i think will that mean that people will agree on blockchain uh probably but it's like is internet behind the scenes yes but does it mean we also have a lot of devices mobile phones and laptops that have changed our workflows also yes so yeah in that way uh it will be behind everything else but it will also have tangible impact on how we conduct what we do anton what is your view yeah so uh I mean I think maybe it was flagged here before in terms of the it's such an early stage industry and uh, for me personally you know because I have I think we all here been here for a while in the crypto space so we see kind of how trends come and go and the things that were very very um, attractive or interesting quite a few years ago today don't exist at all and I think maybe the easiest example today is the biggest hype in the crypto space which are the NFTs and metaverse because of Facebook otherwise if Facebook didn't mention it wouldn't be that popular I think you know right. the impact of us going digital that's long term where Flock will uh, not Flock the blockchain will actually enable us to get there uh, with the goal of actually improving our lives uh, metaverse or NFTs you know I think there's a lot of uh, uh, um, unclear uh, added value beyond the price appreciation uh, what actually happens there in the crypto space so i'll be as biggest as possible i think the price is a lot of driver for uh, how we see uh, the blockchain industry impacting us uh, but long term you know it will enable us to uh, move our lives and move our business and work in the digital space with security and trust obviously thank you ed what is your view Yeah, I think um, uh, whether it's uh, it's behind the scenes or not uh, depends on whether they're truly disrupting that industry. Um, you know, when you disrupt the industry, it's it's going to literally be in your face and it's going to be right there, right? Uh, as in as in Bitcoin, right? It's it's disruptive in that sense, right? But but um, everything that we're we're doing is behind the scenes, and and I think that it would just depend. But I think a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the non crypto use cases will be around. uh behind the scenes uh blockchain so um that's my bet at least thank you sunit so i'll give the last word yeah yeah i i i agree i mean i think everybody's saying the exact same thing so i i would agree with everybody uh i i do have one question for you though if we can end with that if we have a little bit more time we have to end with a group fee so just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but the question is uh and by the way for everybody on this call i think uh you know Tata is a is an extremely extremely number one innovative uh number two large um you know well respected corporate uh in India how are you guys thinking about uh blockchain as a strategy um you know and this I, I would really love to understand that so it I'll um, I'll give you a quick view um so I represent the software part of the group the technology part of the group. um we have implemented um, uh, blockchains for quite a lot of our customers uh, as we speak actually i'm flying off to uh, tomorrow to um, switzerland to actually help uh, build a new blockchain for the united nations for an interesting uh, cryptocurrency for for the un so i think you know it's it, i personally see it, it is it will come mainstream over a couple of years okay. so we have implemented it for quite a lot of interesting um, use cases uh, one for tracking and tracing um, um prawn exports out of india uh, because it gives traceability um, end to end traceability uh, for especially between european union and japan okay. so we are seeing use cases like that and as more and more use cases develop uh, we will see large scale adoption and we we have also got a interesting product that we have developed called quartz 
uh, for helping um, adopting our blockchain so in that uh, on that uh, positive note uh, let me end the session i want to thank all of you i want to thank uh, sam i want to thank uh, john i want to thank um, uh, sunit as well as ted for uh, spending the time thank you very much and uh, we have a selfie okay post selfie okay. moment all right so as i hit the group fee button and it shows me a take a selfie point is that showing up with everybody yeah yeah okay okay let's see how it worked is it compiling yeah <laughs> there we go four All people right. finished selfie okay i'm going to end the group fee thank Let's you thank you great it was fun folks thank you bye bye yeah bye for now thanks everyone thank you thank you thank you yeah thanks and, and thank you grash for uh, organizing everything welcome